Her research is funded by multiple awards from the National Institute for Dental and Craniofacial Research. She received a PhD in MPH in Epidemiology from Boston University School of Public Health. Erica, Dr. Erica Baton. She is the Vice President of the Black Physicians of Utah. She's a proud University of Utah alum. Dr. Baton lends her voice to community advocacy and also education, emphasizing mentorship and leadership. Her impact resonated through webinars, podcasts, and panels, contributing to a more inclusive and informed healthcare landscape. Dr. Baden is an attending physician in an integrative practice here at, at the IO, um, IOC. Surrounded by a remarkable team, she addresses the unique challenges of one of the most medically and behavioral complex demographics. Her dedication to health equity, community service, mentorship, and de um, stigmatizing mental health remains unwavering. Dr. Baden strives to provide equitable access and inclusion to marginalized groups. Her vision extends beyond ex um, conventional healthcare, aiming to address the diverse ways different groups express and experience symptoms. Beyond the confines of her medical practice, Dr. Baden finds solace outdoors, reconnecting with Earth and herself. She draws inspiration from her son, whom she regards as her greatest teacher and joy. Gloria, um, Gloria um, Sladum. She is a research manager for the Research Education Office in the Departments of Pediatrics. Gloria um, directs the, um, the Genomic Summer Research for Magnificence program and manages the Native American Research Internship, NAUTI, program and serves as the Department with Justice and Equity Initiatives. Dr. Sladum is also particularly interested in diversity and genomic research and data identifying what tools effectively increase the participation and retention of individuals in STEM. Dr. Sladum has an MS in medical microbiology and immunology from the University of Madison, Wisconsin, and oncological sciences from the University of Utah, and completed an EMBO postdoctoral fellowship at the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden, Germany where she did an additional studies in research and science communication. Throughout her career, she has integrated her scientific background, her experiences as a first-generation college student, and being a proud Latina scientist to fostering excitement and promote opportunities for all students interested in STEM. Heidi, I, pr I don't want to mispronounce your last name. Iongi. Iongi. Assistant Professor at the University of Utah School of Dentistry and Director of Community Engagement and Clinical Integration. Dr. Iyongi earned her Doctor of Dental Medicine and Master's in Public Health from the University of Nevada, Las, um, Las Vegas. After working in both private practice and public health settings as a general dentist, Dr. Iyongi became an Assistant Professor at the University of Utah School of Dentistry in 2023. Dr. Iyongi serves as the Director of Community Engagement and Clinical Integration for the School of Dentistry. In her role as the Director of Community Engagement, she focuses on designing programs to improve access to oral health care and educating communities on how to improve their oral health. Her research focuses on how integrating the delivery of oral health care with primary care improves both health outcomes and access to care. She is passionate about including advocates like community, community health workers and patient care to improve the patient experience and the quality of care that is delivered. Dr. Iyongi is the mother of two children and enjoys escaping to the mountains with her family for relaxation. Everyone meet your panelists. So today we are gonna be talking about health, um, social determinants of health, health disparities, implicit bias. And as we're having this conversation, we do have some questions that we, I am gonna be posing to the panel, but it also may elicit some thoughts and some questions that you in the audience may have. And so we want this to be a fluid um, and also um, bi-directional conversation that you are having with us and not us having to you. So as we're engaging in this conversation, if you have a question that you would like to ask the panelists, please feel free to ask as we're having this dialogue and not feel that you have to wait to the very end. But we will have also a standard Q&A 
designated towards the end. So I want us to get started with a very um, good question. In looking at social determinants of health and health disparities, starting with our panelists as we're looking at current research and how we can improve it, what role does research play in our understanding of health disparities and social determinants of health currently? Is this on? It should be. It's on. Is it on? Yeah. Oh, all right. <laughs> um, so historically, we've done a lot of research that documents the presence of health disparities. Mm -hmm. And that, ha that needs to end. Um, we know on a, on a pretty general level where we see differences in health outcomes among populations based on the color of your skin, your socioeconomic status, et cetera. And what we have not been doing is really doing work to understand what the drivers of those disparities are. Intersectionality is a, is a really key focus that needs to happen in research to understand health disparities, but we also need to do more work upstream, and that requires different methods than just simply describing the disparity. And one of the problems with that is that we don't have people in the pipeline, in the training pipeline, who are able to do that. And so we've done really well at documenting the presence of disparities, but there needs to be a shift in the approach that we take to really understand what is behind those. Um, if I may add to that, thank you for presenting that um, concern in research. Yes, we need some different people in the pipeline. Um, when we look at disparities, a lot of times it's deemed a genetic concern. Um, but when you look at maternal health disparities, particularly in black women living in the United States, if you control for socioeconomic factors and education, those same disparities are still noted. So there's a bigger concern happening. And we need to have research and understanding about that. The other piece to this is we need to have buy-in from our allies. It can't just be the people sitting in this room continuing the work. So that would be my... Thank you, and I'm going to add uh, from the perspective of um, research and education. Um, I work in the Department of Pediatrics, and we host two summer programs, and we bring diverse talents and experiences, um, and, and these students are undergraduate students, so the pathways that we create to bring the next generation of leaders, scientists, um, physicians, so something that resonates a lot with me our chair always says, you know, children grow, they grow, so we are supporting the ones that were children and we are supporting them with these pathway programs. Um, I want to say that when we were studying um, back in 2010, the department was uh, trying to bring some communities into their clinical studies and they were not very successful, so they went to talk to the leaders, to the elders, and they ask exactly what do you need from us so we can be real partners. And they said, please help us educate our youth. And we listened, so these programs were created like that. So pathway programs that support the next generation of scientists and physicians. Thank you, yes, I, I love that. And um, to add to what's already been said, um, I think we have pathways and we also include our community advocates and we make different sorts of pathways. So, um, you know, not everyone's gonna go to medical school or dental school, but we are creating pathways to all sorts of different opportunities within our research programs and um, opportunities for communities that we're providing, that we're doing research for, that we are creating opportunities within those programs, whether it be for our community advocates, community health workers, that they're participating and we're bringing that value back. Dr. Heaton, if I can ask a follow-up question, because some people may not necessarily understand this term, um, and some people actually may do, so I wanted to level set for everyone. You mentioned the term um, moving upstream. 
And so um, a good visual depiction that you um, can see if you Google is that you see people typically fishing at the river and you keep looking upstream and you see people falling. And they ask the question, why do the people keep falling into the river? And they finally get curious and say, let's walk upstream to see what is happening. Can you explain what that means and how, the, how does that apply in real life situations as we're trying to um, really understand in our research and our application today, what does moving upstream mean? So one of the, when we document health disparities, we're, we're often documenting them according to social factors that are not modifiable, mm -hmm. right? So we can't change the color of a person's skin. We cannot change their genetics. We often cannot change their housing situation or their education level or their income level. Um, but we need to think about what landed them in those spaces, mm -hmm. particularly housing, their socioeconomic status, their educational opportunities, the health care that they're able to access, um, their ability to utilize health care that's available. And so we need to move up and think about those things that are disproportionately pushing individuals in those situations into the river. Mm -hmm. And there are these sort of forces that exist that, that are, are literally pushing them in. Yeah. And we need to understand what those are. What are the selection forces that put somebody into a public housing development, which is where I do a lot of, a lot of my research. Um, what are the, the things that keep people from being able to get into dental care? Mm -hmm. Doing a lot with um, racism and access to dental care and the um, diversity of the dental care workforce, et cetera. So when I talk about upstream, I'm talking about those sort of factors that are outside of an individual's control, personal control, that is that are dictating their circumstances and their ability to do well for themselves. Thank you. And so in thinking about that and um, trying to look at the type of research that we're doing, in what ways can we um, here at the University of Utah translate these tangible interventions um, that we're looking at to address health disparities, to improve the health outcomes of these different populations that we're serving in a very diverse community, whether it's our students on campus, to the very broad communities that we're serving here in, um, in Utah. I think I'd, um, I'd like to touch upon what Dr. Youngi mentioned earlier about the community health workers mm -hmm. and um, hearing and seeing from their lens, because that's very valuable information. They have the boots on the ground mm -hmm. to help the people here really see what's happening in the community and also be the voice of the community. Um, the university is still continuing with plans to build um, a medical center, at least, um, on the west side um, to help improve access um, to this community that has um, been suffering from disparities. Um, I also think that with research, the pathways, the pipelines, having people who have the experience be participants and PIs, uh, principal investigators, excuse me, um, in the research. So that way, again, it's directed towards the needs of the people. I want to bring the language equity I think this is an important topic. This year we have our um, uh, uh, Department of Pediatrics Equity Symposium. Um, Melissa is here, so if you have more questions. Uh, um, so, but anyways, we really dive into what, what is the landscape of language equity in our hospitals. We also have this conception that um, minority-sized communities don't want to participate, for example, in clinical trials, but that's actually not the case. At the end of the day, everyone, let's say, is a parent, and they want the best um, support for their children. So if you ask them, they will participate, but they, you have to invite them, you have to give them access. Of course, there is some very mistrust issues historically, but if you ask, they will participate. So how are we asking? How are we bringing these families into the clinics? Um, are we providing all the information in the language that they speak? Is it cultural appropriate? Uh, is it sensitive? 
Um, so I think that this is a conversation that we need to have. We have to have implementations at all levels. Um, so happy to extend, but I want to also give opportunity to all my fellow panelists. Yeah, um, that's great. And yeah, with what Dr. Baden was saying, if we're trying to make sure that the what we're the outcome of research is bringing value back to the community. So um, we have to be engaged at the very beginning and throughout the process with our community members and that they're involved and that we're attentive and adaptive to their needs. I think that's really important when we're working with the community that um, it's great to have maybe a listening session, but if no action changes from that, then we're not bringing tangible value back. So we have to show that we can adapt to needs and then um, that just makes everything run better. understand what the medical world is doing to sort of bridge that you got all these cultures and I'm black male over 70 what about the white male over 25 all the uh, Hispanic community all of us feeling our pain and our stress those things differently how do you bridge that that's a that's a I'm I'm just knowing right now there's a lot of misdiagnosis because of that commute that intrinsic understanding of communication of culture That is an excellent question and um, a big concern. I think our medical system and the way that we are taught to deliver care really does set the physician or the medical provider up to fail our patients. We are only allotted maybe 12 to 15 minutes, if we're lucky, with you FaceTime, and most of that is spent with maybe the medical assistant rooming you in. So that time is then cut even shorter. And we really don't have the educational training, well, I trained 20 years ago. It's probably better now. Uh, <laughs> the edu tra educational training to thicken the narrative of getting to know our patients, um, knowing the other aspects that affect their care like we were talking about earlier, to understand it's our duty to understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It's our duty to educate ourselves about the non-hospital, non-clinical, factors that are contributing to what is bringing you here. So the onus is not on you, it's, it is on us. And I think that's why we're all here today, is to um, engage in more research from your lens so that when you say, I am sore, I know the right questions to ask you to thicken that narrative, to go deeper, to peel back those layers. Yeah, I think um, it's a, I agree, it's a really great question. And so much of what we do is top down. So we get these sort of national academies or associations that provide recommendations. So for example, we have the American Academy of um, Pediatric Dentistry. And they have recommendations for reducing dental caries in children. And these um, recommendations, they were developed in a fairly sterile environment, right, where the research is just looking at what are the cariogenic mechanisms that are leading to dental caries. But they're not thinking about these recommendations in the context of people's lives. And so unless you give the community a voice to be able to say, this is, this is why I can or I cannot do that. Um, and these are the barriers or the, the enablers that I need to be able to enact these recommendations in my life. And I think there needs to be this sort of flow that goes back and forth between the medical enterprise as well as community programs too, right? A lot of health services for communities 
um, and the community themselves, it takes work and it takes effort. And that type of research is very labor intensive. It can be heavy and it's, but it's so worthwhile and so needed to be done for the very reasons that you're talking about. Um, thank you for your question. As you know, I'm a dentist, and so having people come to me in pain is, you know, every day. And so, um, and it can be, you know, you have maybe your own biases that you need to check, or you experience a certain, you've worked with a certain demographic for a long time, so it's, you think, okay, this is the way pain's described, and then when you're working with diverse populations and different age groups, um, like Dr. Baden's saying, a lot of it is from a practical perspective is taking time and being um, culturally humble. I like that phrase um, over culturally competent because it's a worthwhile endeavor to be culturally competent, but um, we it's impossible for us to ever fully understand everyone else, everyone's culture. But when we come at it with humility that I don't understand, and but I want to, and so then I'm gonna take more time and ask questions, and so, um, for me as a provider, it's a lot of, you know, when someone says we're in pain, lots of examples, lots of questions to try and um, understand that in a way. And then working with our partners like our, I, I know I keep saying it, but community health workers in our clinic that help give us a different lens. And sometimes we get stuck in our own ways of, the, of seeing things. And that community health worker sometimes comes in and says, that's not what they meant when they said that. You thought they meant that, but that's not what they meant. And so having people like that on your team is really helpful. So if you all will oblige me, I, I did want to make a small comment. As my background prior to coming in, back into higher education was working uh, with patients living with sickle cell and hemophilia and HIV. So chronic pain is a, a major conduit of those living with those diseases. Um, in 2022, the CDC came, finally came out with some recommendation guidelines for um, non-cancerous pain, which I think has been beneficial for physicians to finally have some guidelines. It's a framework to help them out with that. But I think one piece that um, we're going to talk about in a little bit is talking about health communications, not just from the physician to patients, but from the patient's viewpoint to their physician the term that is beneficial for us in terms of social determinants of health is health literacy. How do I advocate for myself? Who do I need to bring with me into my appointments? Um, what type of terms do I need to be aware of to communicate my pain with my physician to be able to understand the difference between um, how I measure my pain, how do I track it, um, what app do I need to download, hint, hint, so I can give them some measurable numbers. And so there needs to be some, um, some health education and some literacy that we um, as a community need to be taught. Because um, there also is a side point that I have to uh, mention to many of the, um, the clients that I used to serve, which is um, it's a, the communication is bi-directional. Patients have to learn how to communicate their needs and advocate for themselves, but also learn that the physicians have been put in a very tough and sticky predicament due to the current landscape that we're sitting in, known as the opioid epidemic. They have guidelines that they have to follow, so how do we meet in the middle to say, I need to see my patient, not as a drug seeker, not as a person who just left the room, but this is person, this is Bob in front of me, and everything else that came before me was just before me. This is a brand new patient and I have to wipe my face and see that person as is. So I do think there has to be some ed education known as health literacy um, on the patient side too, but that's not necessarily something that I can just go and automatically know it. Healthcare workers, community health workers can teach that. Google does have it too. You can type in health literacy, how do I communicate with my physician? Um, and then there are some apps. How do I track my pain? So you can take that tracker with you to your physician's um, appointment. Can I just add while we're talking about research, um, because your, your question mentioned that pain for you might be different from pain in another, in another demographic. And we, we have come a long ways in terms of inclusion and research, but we still have a long ways to go and figuring out how to bring more diverse populations and perspectives and lived experiences mm -hmm. into our research so that we can do more tailoring based on all of those backgrounds. So a good, 
Did you want to respond? I just wanted to add a piece. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very powerful to see some of our students during a um, uh, National Institute of Health meeting that we held last year. And at this meeting, the students demand to have examples uh, that represent mm. all the demo uh, demographic uh, culture. And for me, that was very empowering to see that the students is our education. We want more examples. We want more descriptions. Um, if you look at the textbooks, the majority don't talk about us. So we need this information. This will create health and health positive health outcomes for all. So this is also on us as uh, students, as uh, uh, educators, that we demand more information that is inclusive. So one question I wanted to ask you all, we talked about the research piece, and then we, talk, we were talking about the, the environments that our patients are entering into. What type of environments, such as multidisciplinary care, population health, um, interdisciplinary clinics, what role do those types of service environments, um, what roles do those play in addressing health disparities and also social determinants of health? I have the pleasure and honor of working in the same clinic as Dr. Yonggi. So we have an integrated practice where oral health care and medical health care can be delivered in the same space. I don't know who thought to separate the mouth from the rest of <laughs> medical care. Anyway, we'll keep going. Uh, <laughs> and vision, but that's another thing. Um, so we have a practice where we have behavioral health therapists, we have medical providers, we have dentists, we have community health workers, we have um, students and other learners. We also have transportation we have a food pantry slash pharmacy. We have clothes that were donated. We have, it's just an incredible space and I feel very fortunate to be there. And, and I wish all healthcare could be delivered in that capacity. And we are centralized in the community that needs us most. Our appointments are 30 to 60 minutes with each patient. And they can have, again, it's just almost this one stop shop. So for somebody to take time off, which means that they are not getting paid for that time, to find transportation to get to their appointment, and have their dental, medical, and behavioral health care needs met in one day in one space. The other thing is we don't turn people away if they're late. Life happens. <laughs> we don't charge you if you're late. Life happens. Um, and again, having a community health worker available, somebody that is in that community that understands things that we may not see as medical providers that can help educate us to provide better care and access. Um, that has been an, an instrumental role in improving healthcare outcomes. And since the inception of this clinic, we have actually saved the healthcare plan millions of dollars over time, and that's how we are funded. We are not a for-profit clinic. And we have also been able to decrease healthcare utilization that may not be appropriate healthcare utilization. Mm -hmm. And I think we've also been able to empower a demographic of, of people that may have been overlooked and misunderstood. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Dr. Baden, you, you brought this up, and we all have mouths, and <laughs> we're in a, uh, a college campus, so though I'm being vain right now, I wear glasses since I was five years old. Mm -hmm. And so many of us do, right? And there's always this disconnect where health insurance, if you have it, oftentimes uh, is separated from medical, dental, vision. Uh, and by the way, we're finally going to get vision uh, insurance here, which blows my mind that uh, they didn't already have it. It really does. So with regard, I'd like to stay with dentistry for a moment. It seems to me everybody eats, you know, kids uh, th through uh, adulthood. Can you give me a sense of how important um, dental health is as it relates to our overall health? Because I would imagine uh, if, if you're not fortunate enough to have dental care to insure a kid, that could be pretty tough. Mm -hmm. And it would, you know, I would imagine it would have some kind of a residual impact on your overall health. Excellent, and I would like both Barbara Heaton and <laughs> Dr. Ayungi to, to um, add to that because they are the experts in that field and understand how interconnected we all are and how important um, we have 
the dental and integrated medical care has been for certain populations. Um, there are diseases in the mouth that can precipitate heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so please <laughs> take that away. I could talk for days <laughs> about this. This is, this is something I've become personally very, very passionate about. And there are so many things that have brought us to this point that are historical, they're educational, they're political, that have driven the separation of medicine and dentistry. And um, it is a major contributor to oral health disparities, obviously, but also overall health disparities. And because of that separation, one of the biggest challenges when we're talking about research, I'm gonna talk about research again, um, is that we don't have cohorts that have both oral health data and medical data. We, so we don't have population cohorts that have both, of, both sets of those information. We don't have clinical cohorts because of the separation of an electronic health record that has dental information and medical information. And so being able to document and study the relationship between oral health and overall health has been very challenging and this separation has thus been perpetuated. So a major goal that I have had in my uh, career as an epidemiologist is trying to integrate oral health information into large population-based cohorts. So I have worked for a number of years now with a black women's health study, which is a national cohort of 59,000 black women. And we started introducing oral health measures into that cohort in 2007. And we've been able to understand, in, in just a limited set of oral health measures, and been able to understand the impact of a lack of access to quality oral health care on the overall health of these women. The same thing with a um, North American fertility cohort. So I don't know how many of you know this, but if you have periodontitis in pregnancy, you have a two to three fold increase in your risk for preterm or low birth weight outcomes. Is that gum disease? It's, it, yes, we'll call it gum disease. <laughs> yes, gu gum disease. In black women, it can be as much of an eight times higher risk of preterm and low birth weight um, outcomes when they have periodontitis during pregnancy. And so we've been working with this fertility cohort to get oral health measures in at preconception. And we've been, sh we've been showing that oral health prior to conception increases the time to pregnancy, the poor oral health, so periodontitis, gum disease. It increases the time to pregnancy. It increases your risk of spontaneous abortion. We're doing work with gestational diabetes, eclampsia, and as well as birth outcomes. And interestingly, we're seeing disparities based on race as well. So it's the, the issues are so complex that have led to this division. Marginalized and minoritized populations, they lose all of their teeth much more frequently and earlier in life. And we've been able to do work that shows that they have a much higher increased hazard of mortality. They're dying earlier as a result of losing all of their teeth. So there are really powerful connections between the mouth and the body that have been difficult to study because of all of these sort of historical, political issues that have separated medicine and dentistry, and we need to overcome that. I'll be quiet, I won't talk for days. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you, you really covered everything, but um, from a clinical perspective, to answer your question, I think that we definitely see Dr. Baden and I every day that a patient's poor oral health is affecting their diabetic control or um, yeah, impacting their heart disease. And so when we're able to take care of those in an integrated way when we work together so that we can address their oral health concerns to try and improve their diabetic control and we can also try and um, improve their diabetic control to um, make their outcomes better on their oral health procedures. And so it's really all works together and when we do it in that fashion, we get better 
results and also the patient experience is better and I think it's been a really good education opportunity for the groups of patients that we work with that because of the separation patients usually have no idea what we're talking about so when I tell them you know this procedure is going to be more challenging because of your maybe your diabetic diabetes control that's really shocking like what does my mouth and my diabetes have to do with one another. And so it's been an opportunity for us to educate and um, help the patients have more control over their own health. There have also been instances where, you know, Dr. Yonggi is about to do a procedure on a patient and their blood pressure is elevated and they had no idea. She will just walk literally down the hall and will <laughs> intervene right there and then. So that prevents some delay in access to care. I just want to, um, is that okay? Oh, I have a question. I, I, don't have a, I don't have a question per se. Uh, Paul Sanchez, South Salt Lake City Council. So I spent the last two years attending conferences nationally for dentists. I specifically was doing tax credits, research and development tax credits for dentists. And I felt uncomfortable in those spaces. A brown person, right? And based on what I was seeing visually, nine out of 10 dentists are white. And so if a brown person trying to help a dentist save money on their taxes felt uncomfortable, I can only imagine how other ethnic minorities would feel going to their dentist, being comfortable enough to let them know they have issues. So for me, I feel like part of the solution is making sure that we have more dentists of color to help marginalized communities. Thank you. Yes, I, I absolutely agree. Thank you so much for sharing. And what I was going to say was along those lines. So we have been talking about an, a scenario where um, the patients are here in an ideal location. But how about rural communities? So um, yes, uh, one thing that we are doing at the Department of Pediatrics is our American Indian and Alaskan Native students that come to our summer program, mm -hmm. we connected with the dental school and they can do research in the dental school. The hope is that they will go back to their reservation, their communities. So we hope to bring more uh, diverse experiences and talents to all communities and it's very, very needed. I'm just going to say that I, I definitely agree with you, and it's um, dentistry in, in some ways is just behind all, with a lot of things, and I think that's definitely one of them. Um, and at the School of Dentistry, we're actively working to try and create pipelines. Um, we've developed a post bac program called our pre-cap program where we enroll students from medically underserved backgrounds that have the... Um, intention to um, serve these communities when they graduate and so we can support them for a year through scholarship and help them to then have entrance into uh, the School of Dentistry and have a successful time while they're there. So I think your point is excellent and um, yeah, we all need to work on that. If, if I might, I'm so, glad, I'm so glad that you said that. I mean, it's astonishing to me in Utah I believe it's 96% of dentists are white males. 96%. I think that was in like 2018. So it may it may have improved. 95%. 95%. But <laughs> going in the right direction, but not the, of the right magnitude. Um, and I do a lot of research on dental care related fear and anxiety. And we, you know, the gentleman talking about pain, right? In the Black Women's Health Study cohort, we looked at dental care-related fear and anxiety, and those who had the highest levels, the, when you look at the fear-inducing stimuli, it's an unkind or unsympathetic dentist not feeling like they have control or autonomy over what's happening in the dental chair. And so not only do we need a more diverse dental profession, but we need to be training the people who are in the profession to, to engage in compassionate care and to be able to understand what they're doing and how it intersects with the lived experiences of the individuals who are in their chair. Even the way dentistry is done, people are in a vulnerable position. 
they're they're reclined back they you you have stuff in your mouth you often feel like you might be suffocating or choking um, so there is a lot yes we need a more di diverse dental workforce and that's super important but in addition we need to be training people to be able to address the issues and the lived experiences of, of individuals and give them communication opportunities in that setting to just make it better. Have a question? Good morning, panel. Thank you for your uh, comments and to our moderator. And uh, this is always a greatly needed conversation. Uh, you all have addressed uh, uh, things that we sort of already know, particularly if you're in these spaces around how bias influences care, how research is still lacking, how research still focuses on uh, majority populations and perspectives. Um, I'm a little concerned about the notion of window dressing that's in the ethers in this room around we need a quote unquote more diverse workforce. We may need more quote unquote ethnic minorities versus recognizing that we are all diverse. So let's name the kind of diversity we're talking about. And with that said, I'm really curious and I'm dating myself, but I'm thinking of Tom Cruise and uh, Jerry Maguire. When he wrote this, his manifesto, sure it cost him his job, but if we were talking about majority dominant religious, social, cultural, uh, groups and if there was harm being done to them, they would take that radical approach. So I'm asking you not to sacrifice your job with your comments. What is your manifesto to truly disrupt health disparities in your disciplines? I, I, know. I mean, as the moderator, I feel like I, I, I don't mind starting since I serve at the behest of you all as your AVP. One of the biggest things that I'm trying to do to disrupt and be radical in this is to go upstream, to disrupt the silos that we have here on this campus um, because there seems to be a, a lack of acknowledging that we have a healthcare system on this campus with the five departments that I oversee our counseling center, our center for disability and access, our recreation, our university um, um, our center for campus wellness, and also um, which also houses our victim survivor advocacy, and then also our student health center. Each one of them is separate. None of them shares information. None of them wants to talk to each other. And as I shared with you all, my background is in ambulatory care. I have worked in Ryan White, and I have worked in sickle cell disease for the past 15 years of my life. All I know is multidisciplinary care. We go in as a team, we do 45 to 60 minute sessions, and we walk out and we debrief. Nobody wants to talk. But yet, if we look at the types of students that we are seeing on our campus, we have higher, new, um, higher numbers of neurodiversity, we have higher numbers of students who have moderate to um, severe anxiety and depression, and I have faculty members saying, I don't know how to handle this student in my class. I've never seen this before. But no one wants to share information. How we have typically served mental health and wellness on this campus is that we have been firefighters. Something happens, we put out the fire. Something happens, we put out the fire. And what I'm asking to start the narrative is, is that we stop being firefighters. I don't know about you all, but I'm a larger woman in this body and I can't keep carrying um, the, the suit, um, the hose, and the ladder. And I've asked my staff and I've also begun to have conversations within departments is that we have to start sharing information and we have to realize that wellness is also student success. It's the same thing. Wellness doesn't sit over here and student success and academic success doesn't sit over here. If we want a student to be able to enter into the University of Utah, to have a sense of belonging, to matriculate, to graduate within four to five years, and also be great alumni, then they have to have a sense of access to resources, health literacy, and understand that we have to look at our approach 
to how we serve our students differently. And that starts with us knowing who our students are, population health, prior to them stepping foot onto this campus. So we gotta ask some questions. So yes, I'm trying to shake down some trees, some ladders, some windows. Um, and that means that everybody from admissions to the registrar's office to recruitment, we have to, and then also on the academic side, we have to start working collaboratively together. Next. Okay. Um, very hard to follow, but <laughs> um, I'm going to say that our office, this might sound very funny for some of us, but we practice radical love. Mm. And when we bring our students into our programs, we make sure that we think of everything, and of course we miss some things, but I can almost in every single table here, we have reached out to one, at least one person in the table, and you have supported our students. I also want to thank Walita Ranger here. She's our program coordinator for the Native American Summer Research Internship. We sometimes stay until two in the morning because the students miss their flight, and we try to find another alternative. Um, if they have food insecurities, they might come to the program, but they need to send the money to their families. We connect them. <laughs> so almost, it's, this is radical love. And uh, it's not, it's, I'm not ashamed to say that word. We need more love in this life. We need more, uh, you know, you are here, you belong, and we're going to support you through this. We have an amazing office, Courtney Tori FCC, me, our fearless ma um, uh, leader, Maya Hosty. And so it's not isolated, it's not just my love, it's the love of this group. And this is what I wanna say about our radical position. <laughs> um, thank you. Radical love is needed throughout this community and beyond. Um, what I would say from, from my lens is we had the audacity in 2021 to start Black Physicians of Utah and step away from the university and not wait for the university to reach out to the community. And so we provided a faith and facts series to help um, educate our community about certain diseases and disparities and then also have a health advocacy panel to help empower um, our community to advocate for themselves in a medical setting. We are enthusiasts about recruitment and retention. Yes, we are only 2% of this population, but we are tiny and mighty and deserve a voice. And so we are working so hard. When we find, no, GME does not tell us if we have a, a black resident or a black uh, medical student, we go out and find you. <laughs> and, I, and we're breaking some laws to do that, and thank God we're still here. Um, but we, <laughs> so please keep that to yourselves. But we are doing, <laughs> those are some of the steps that we're taking. We are going up to the Hill. We are, legisl we are um, advocates, we are uh, lobbyists. We invite students to our home. We may not have boundaries, but we try to hold space for them in ways that, um, go beyond um, the bounds of a mentor, um, of a mentor. We try to embrace them as family. And then we also support each other. I think having a mentor or somebody that's like family and support at all levels and stages of your career, whether you've been in the game for decades or just for days, um, supporting each other in, in a way you have the opportunity to learn from somebody who just started. Um, don't, don't ever feel that you have ach achieved all these accolades and, and these degrees, therefore you know it all. Just being curious and staying open. Amazing comments um, and an amazing question. I think we tend to fall back on the language that we use because it's, it's easier. Um, we don't have a language for talking about how to change our, change our natures, how to become new creatures, how to just be loving and compassionate. And, and we, can, we can't describe that well in a way that is tangible, actionable, et cetera. And so I think we fall back on that language because we see, we see opportunities for action and ways to address some of the structural supports or, or, or um, situations that drive what we're seeing. 
And, and so it, it's difficult. I, I totally appreciate that comment about, about falling back on that language and, and trying to push, push that and push the boundary of that into something that gets us further. I think accountability is a big, is a big thing that we need. Um, and if I can just draw on my experience in working in the field of, of dentistry, there's a lot of latitude that dentists have relative, relative to medical providers in terms of sort of oversight. Um, they can practice in their private practice. Their charts are kind of isolated. No, people aren't monitoring their, their practice, et cetera. And so one thing that I'm trying to do is to do research that holds dentists accountable for the care that they're providing, for the quality of care that they're providing. Um, and I'm probably not gonna make many friends uh, doing that uh, because dentistry, frankly, likes being isolated as a profession. There's a lot of value that the profession gains from being segregated from medicine. Um, but I think that if we can be accountable or hold people accountable based on quality science, and research that kind of helps corral us all to something better, that can be a potential solution. But ultimately, we, we all to some degree need to change our natures and be you know, more radical in our love um, for others and for the lived experiences of others. Thank you, yes, for your question. Um, I think for, you know, I work mostly with patients and um, for students coming in, I think that like Dr. Heaton is saying, that dentistry has this way, you know, that we kind of train students to, okay, you're gonna go back to this cottage industry and, you know, even if you come from a different background, maybe we're not supporting the your experience, we're kind of saying, come in and do it the way that we've done it, go back to your private practice and practice that way. And that's not being um, supportive and that's not changing the field. So I think that when we are radical in um, the way that we're trying to change our clinics and you know, dentist, dental students, they start treating patients very quickly um, by their second year, you know, they're in the clinic a lot of the time. And so if we're modeling that in like Dr. Baden saying, even with our policies of looking at the patient as a whole person and, oh, you're late, therefore we're not gonna see you or you got a fee or um, you know, three strikes, you're out. That's not making the student feeling supported that this space is them. Cause that's, you know, that's might not be the background that they came from. So we're not making it feel supportive. So I think of when we have to change our approach to our clinic spaces and um, yeah, just make it, make it more supportive for um, students from, to see that that change. And also the other thing I was gonna mention was with the cottage industry and the separation with dental insurance and medical insurance and historically um, groups like Medicaid don't offer very much dental coverage and that's something that's changing in our state and that we're actively working on. And so changes like that also make a big difference in who has access to that care and the quality of care that's given, um, like Dr. Heaton saying, so that we can be accountable to that. So recently, um, as of a few days of, um, ago, um, on the big Capitol Hill, um, there have been some conversations and recent legislations of trying to um, possibly re remove federal funding from medical schools who have um, EDI um, within um, their curriculum. So we know if it starts with medical schools, it's gonna possibly trigger down to other types of allied health schools. How do we protect the type of rigorous curriculum that we're trying to impart on our trainees? How do we continue to do this type of work um, in training our trainees and, um, and therefore in turn, long-term, providing quality care um, when we have this current political landscape? How do we continue to do the work? We talked a lot about language earlier, mm -hmm. and we may not be able to say DEI explicitly, but we can use other language to do the same work and continue the same work, or even improve and expound upon what we're doing. 
Um, Dr. Yonggi mentioned the way that we model the care that we give and the access that we provide. That is another way that we can continue to do the work without explicitly saying DEI. So continuing to have diverse lenses, very specific diverse lenses in the field of medicine and dentistry and research in our trainees um, and out in the community, the work will continue. We will not be silenced. <laughs> I think to that point, um, Dr. Haight and, and I were recently at a research conference, and one of our colleagues from University of Michigan, I just want to share something that he had said that, because um, he, he works in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and when he first, when the office first started, it was called the Office of Minority Affairs, and that was changed over time to be the Office of Multicultural Affairs with um, feedback from the community. And then it was changed again to be the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And he gave this example to share that the work didn't change, the name changed, and that you know we shouldn't be frightened of that and that we can keep marching forward with the work. And so um, that's all credit to um, our colleague from University of Michigan, but I, I just found it very helpful. So we have about 10 minutes um, for questions in Q&A, wanted to open it up to the audience to see if there were any questions that you have for our panelists. <laughs> any questions? We have a question up front. Oh, one second, so the people in the on the website can hear. mentioned earlier how the patients can be in charge of their medical their health. Would each of you man, man, maybe take a, a second to say what one thing you think is a, a patient could do for their health and, and, and managing their health provider? So, uh, what, what, what one thing that you would think would be important to, from your perspective that will help us to help manage our health provider? Ask questions and see the person across from you not in a power dynamic. And I think that's how we were trained is to have this hierarchy. But this person is in service to you and remember that. And I think once you level that um, service, that care, then I think you may not be as afraid um, to speak what is on your heart and what you need. Um, this is about you in that moment, not the person sitting across from you as a patient. This is about you, so remember that. Um, how would you recommend, oh. um, how would you recommend, since you guys had talked about like communication being a two-way street, if you feel like your doctor, physician, um, like you're struggling to like communicate what you need to communicate with them <laughs> or like if you feel like there is that power dynamic like you feel like because i've had situations where i was like oh that was condescending or whatever <laughs> and so like or that was very dismissive and like you know i have to i don't know how would i see someone else see someone else <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you do you do have that right to seek another opinion and and um find somebody that understands and is willing to right. engage in that kind of a conversation. Okay. Yeah. Right. I'm just going to say, you know, as, if sometimes that's not an option, you know, maybe, or it's not as much of an option, maybe in a rural community or something like that, is to remember that you don't have to do things on their timeline. So sometimes I think in medicine and dentistry, we start feeling rushed of the visits are quick. And so maybe you didn't feel like you were heard. And so, you know, always you can slow it down, take another visit, and then also use advocates. You know, um, the, the clinic may have, you know, a community health worker, a case manager, or someone that is easier to talk to and, and use that as, you know, you can bring whoever you want to your appointment. And if that helps you advocate for yourself, um, sometimes that can be useful. 
And I want to add that many times when we go to see a provider, we receive a survey. And many times, at least I do it, I, I don't have time for this. I think this is an important tool to express um, your experience. And I understand that these are read and that these are taken into consideration. So I don't think that it goes into the void. So use that tool. And I would just say that Yes, patients should, should be empowered, but we still need to do a lot for them um, in terms of communicating things. I recently worked with um, a community group called Turn Community Services and worked with their, um, their client advocates and their, and their caseworkers. And even there, they did not know that Medicaid was providing comprehensive dental care for people with disabilities. And when their clients were going to the dentist, they were like coming back with all of their teeth pulled and they started to develop the opinion of, well, why would we ever send our patients or our clients to the dentist? Cause they'll just come back with their teeth pulled. I can only speak to dentistry, but there's a lot of latitude in what providers are deciding to do that have to do with the insurance coverage that's available. Sometimes it's, you get reimbursed more to extract a tooth than to restore a tooth. And so if you, can if you can educate yourself on what is available to you and what your options are, that's great. But we need to do a better job of making sure that communities are aware of what they have available to them. Because that's just a shame when that happens. I just want to make a, a point that was raised earlier. And um, this is for um, individuals that experience le uh, language other than English. And sometimes the, these individuals don't know that it's actually in the, in the um, legislation that they can have access to translators and to have extra support at no additional cost. So I think this is important for health, commu health community workers to provide this information to the communities. <coughs> you are not, you are entitled to this service. So use it, ask for that. Yes. Kind of piggybacking um, off that question in regards to my doctor is condescending. How, what is the best way of finding providers that look like us? that we can feel that connection of like, this person is gonna take my best interests in heart. I, I think for me speaking, it took, it's taken me a very long time to find a provider that I feel comfortable with. I have had a lot of terrible experiences of this doctor's not taking me serious. I will go and find someone, but then it adds time to get my needs met. Excellent question and um, and statement. You know, um, I'm, I want to just apologize to you for your experience, but and also just share that it's such a common experience. Unfortunately, um, representation in medicine is important. Not just representation in our our skin color or um, our ethnicity, but in lived experience. Um, we at Black Physicians of Utah have tried to vet um, a group of providers that people have access to, um, both allies and uh, physicians of color. We've also um, extended our, our group and our team to include a Latino Physicians of Utah contingent um, so that they can help organize and reach out to the community for similar purposes. Um, there are apps now that are nat nationwide that help connect people based on certain criteria that you're looking for in a provider, and so that might be something that you can um, use. I don't remember the name of those specific apps, um, but I can get them to you. I know you, so I got you. <laughs> Any additional questions? Well, I will, yes, we have one more. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, thank you all for sharing a space with us and sharing all your expertise and knowledge. Um, I am Raquel Ketz and I work here at the University of Utah's Dream Center. Um, and in particular, 
especially when it comes to health access. Um, and I know, Gloria, you touched a little bit about in-language support. Um, and I think something that came up was also the conversation of technological access. Uh, when I think about older uh, patients, especially if they're 55 or 65 years or older, um, I don't think that those that it's not as accessible, like those services aren't directly as accessible. So I'm just wondering what on the ground support exists already to support those direct populations that may not have access to like vehicles, transportation, et cetera, or even like a cell phone, like what other methods may exist for them um, to connect with the different services that exist. Um, and alongside with that, since we are talking about equity, uh, I know that here in the state of Utah, undocumented, there's, there's been a lot of different laws and policies that have gone into effect and advocacy around like um, healthcare access for children that actually recently passed last year or so and has gone into effect, I believe, this year, um, or will go into effect. So. Um, I think when it just comes to working with undocumented populations and the lack of access to health care for them, um, how are your direct services then being offered at a low cost or being advertised to undocumented populations? 55 is not that old, just so you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fact check. Right, right. <laughs> So to answer your question for um, undocumented populations, um, at the School of Dentistry, we have lots of programs that we use to try and target folks. So we have a mobile van that goes out to rural locations, and everything is done free of charge. And um, the, the vetting process does not include um, any sort of check of documentation status or anything like that. Um, we also have different assistant programs. Um, and I think the best one is that we partner with community organizations so that the clients themselves, the patients themselves, don't have to go through any sort of vetting, but we can partner with the community. So we do this a lot with um, like the Catholic community services for um, newcomer and refugee populations. So we make that partnership and then we can provide dental care um, free of charge or to reduce charge to patients within their system without the patients themselves having to go through any sort of you know vetting or anything like that of their income status or anything. So I think that's a really useful way is to leverage our community resources and build those relationships and partnerships. There's a couple of resources that I know um, just uh, that bring that come to my mind at the moment. So we have the wellness bus at the University of Utah, similar to the band that, that goes around, so uh, Rose Park. So I think this is a good point to emphasize those collaborations that uh, Dr. Cohen was uh, talking about this morning and the panelists this morning or the speakers this morning were saying, we need to be in contact. We need to know the needs and what is required at the moment. So um, I would love to talk more with you, for example, so we can connect with other resources and programming. So the wellness bus, and also there are new clinics and hospitals that are being opened at the moment that are more, for example, in the West, um, the West Clinic. So I know that these, these are things that are happening. Probably the most important thing for us is to be able to know so we can actually offer that information to others. And that's where community partnership and col collaborations are super important. Um, I wanted to, I was going to share that. The, the West High School just opened a clinic right in the high school itself to serve about 7,000 students um, beyond the district. And they do, it's a pediatric adolescent clinic, but they do have a case manager that will help uh, parents navigate the healthcare system and other social services. And so that's one avenue as well. And again, I don't think we have expressed enough how valuable it has been to have community health workers um, to bridge some of those or even close some of those gaps, and then birth workers as well. Um, they have been such a, a value and instrumental piece of um, extending health care. So they might drive our patients to and from appointments. Um, they help coordinate some of that care. They um, 
help um, some of our patients access government phones. There are government phones that are just basic flip phones that people can have access to free of charge if they don't have their own cell phone. And so having a case manager, community health worker who's knowledgeable about some of those social services, that can extend to that demographic. Sarah Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, so Sarah Elizabeth Garzalevich, she the basic needs director here at the University of Utah. So I love the conversation. I love the disruption comment. I love all the work that's going on. And I'm a social worker by training, so I'm going to end with a little hope, my comment. Um, I've got hope in a bag over here. We need it. <laughs> uh, so I have a big brother who has Down syndrome. Both of our parents are dead and I am a guardian and conservator of my brother John's care. I will say I've seen social change. So your comment around turn community services that supports individuals with intellectual disabilities is one of several agencies in the state of Utah that does. I am a tireless advocate for my brother John's care. I've had to have conversations when people are assessing his quality of life. I've had to say he is loved and he will survive the surgery because he is unquestionably the most resilient person I've ever met. John turned 50 in September. Still not old, okay, you know. You know, but he was born at a time when they were still institutionalizing individuals with Down syndrome. And my mother said, is he okay? <laughs> I'm taking my baby home. He's fine, he's happy, he's cooing, he's coming home with me. And so she instilled really an early belief in, in health and human rights and advocacy, and it always falls on the community itself <laughs> to advocate for rights. But I have seen social change, and he does have access to health care because of tireless advocacy and disruption of, of um, systems. And so I think that's what I want to say, is because of the work and the ongoing work, we're standing on the work of the shoulders of people that have advocated for a long time. We're continuing to do that, and I have seen change, and there is hope in that. So thanks to everybody for their work and our continued work, because it ain't done. Thank you so much. I would like to thank our panelists, Dr. Heaton, Yongi, Baton, and Slatum for just the wonderful words and also the, the information you have been able to share with us this, um, this morning, going into this afternoon. Thank you all so much, and also thank you to our audiences that have been here. I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon and continue to engage with us um, on this day. Thank you so much. So right now, what we'd like to do is that uh, we're going to take a break, and as you all can smell the jerk over there. <laughs> get some uh, lunch.